Hello my loves, it's Liz Ann here from High Vibes Life and today I want to go into some depth about the dance between the narcissist and the empath. In the first part of the video, I'm going to talk about the uh, dynamics of the narcissist versus the empath. In the second part, I am going to talk about what attracts them to each other and the cycle that they go through as far as the attraction and then eventually the disattraction, the what they call the de devaluation of the narcissist and the breakup and that whole thing. I'm gonna go into the cycle of the narcissist and the empath and I am also going to discuss how to exit the dance of the narcissist and the empath so that you can create more of a more happier life experience and more healthier relationships. So stay tuned. I wanted to talk about first about the dynamics between the empath and the narcissist and what makes them different. Up here, you'll see that I have that there's a magnet between them. There's an attraction. There's a high attraction between the highly sensitive person and the narcissist. This is a dynamic that happens over and over again. We see it in relationships, not just romantic relationships, but in friendships, in work situations, in a lot of religions, and the way the religious religious corporations are set up are highly inundated with narcissists and empaths. And so right now I I'm just want to focus on the relationship as far as probably a spousal type of relationship or a, um, a more of a romantic type relationship. When you have a, an empath and a narcissist that is deeply wounded, both of them have the same wound of and need to feel self-worth. They both are needing that in a very deep way. And this is the magnet between them, is they're trying to find this self-worth in each other, okay? The difference between them is that with an empath, an empath finds their self-worth by being needed. They feel like if they are needed, then that will help them feel worthy of love or worth, have that self-worth. You can find a lot of empaths and highly sensitive people trying to fill this need as a healer, a therapist, a teacher. Okay, I am an empath and highly sensitive person. I can relate very closely to this. I've also had many narcissistic relationships and I understand a lot pretty deeply of how they think and feel. The narcissist finds their self-worth in feeling important. They need to feel very important and they'll usually find this sense of importance in roles such as being a president, uh, not necessarily of the nation, although that could be, but of a company, a leader um, in powerful positions such as a, a, a cop or an officer. And they like to feel that they are the best at whatever they are doing. And this gives them a real sense of self-importance, which equals to self-worth, okay? Then we have the way that this is validated. So we all need validation. We all seek validation, right? The empath needs validation or gets their validation with grat from gratitude, from appreciation, and from adoration. So they love things that people say such as about them or to them, such as thank you so much. You are wonderful. You changed my life. I don't know how I could ever repay you. I don't know what I would do without you. I can't get enough of you. I feel so alive because of you. Now these last two statements would be probably more in romantic type situations. They really want to be adored by their romantic partner. They want them to be very grateful that they have them in their life and be really appreciated by their romantic partner. The narcissist 
gets their validation by praise, respect, and attention. Now, there may be other variations of this, but this is just general. Okay, I'm going general here. So they love to hear things like, you're awesome. No one can do it as good as you. You deserve the position. Did you see him or her? Like, wow, did you see what they did? Tell me more about you and your amazing life. They love to be the center of attention. Where empaths don't necessarily want to be, they like attention, but they don't want to be the center of attention. A narcissist loves having attention on them and people praising them and saying how wonderful they are. And that I think, I think you should be the judge. They like to be in positions of, of being the judge of what's right or wrong or, of, you know, like perhaps they are judging a competition. They love to feel like they um, are the judge of it. And your opinion is always right on point. They like to be able to have something to say and that people think it's profound and that they're profound. Narcissists want to be an elevated position. They want to be seen where an empath wants to be in a very needed position. They want to be appreciated and needed deeply, okay? So we can already start to see as we're looking at this where there's a magnet going on. One thing that I do want to point out is that the uh, narcissist is a projector and the empath is an absorber. And I will explain more of that next. I do want to point out that none of this on here is wrong or bad, okay? But what we're looking into is the dance that starts to happen where they're trying to get their self-worth from the other person, the other side, rather than finding their self-worth and their validation from within what they need. And that takes healing of some wounding that has gone on. And the reason why so many people say the narcissist won't ever get any better is because of this, this idea here that you um, are awesome and nobody can do it as good as you, that you, you know, you're not wrong, your opinion is right, you should be the judge. So to have to go in and say, hey, there is something that you're not seeing here. There is something that is kind of causing issues here with you is to actually make them feel the lack of validation and to sever their sense of self-worth. Another thing I want to point out is that both the empath and the narcissist are highly sensitive individuals. The reason why an empath tends to get praised for their highly sensitivity more than a narcissist or a narcissist doesn't even see is because narcissists are known to say, oh, they don't have empathy. And that is because, again, the narcissist is the projector. And so what they do is all the wounding that they have felt, they have numbed because they've needed to feel self-worth so deeply that they have numbed that wounding and they have found that projecting it away from them onto somebody else takes it off them and gives them the runway to feel all these things that they so desperately want to feel, which is, you know, that they're highly respected, that people have their attention on them and that they're being praised throughout that, right? That they are, um, Admi highly admired that would have been a good word up there. They're highly admired. So that's why they get a bad rap and sometimes rightly so. But the empath on the other hand, because they tend to be an absorber and they don't re uh, as much project onto other people, they tend to more absorb. So they basically will go within and when uh, their wounding hits or their wounding, they're always questioning themselves, not other people. They're always uh, blaming themselves and questioning themselves 
And because of that, people don't feel that projection and they tend to be more uh, softer on them because they are already being really hard on themselves. And so that's what's going on. But both are highly sensitive. The highly sensitive narcissist is just a projector. So he takes his sensitivity and he projects it onto somebody else. Okay. But the empath, they take their sensitivity and they absorb it into their self. Okay. So now we are going to talk about the dance between the narcissist and the empath or what some also term as the abusive cycle of the narcissist and the empath. And what I titled this is, it takes two to tango. Because I really want to put an emphasis on this. Because we always have this, so many things out there about the narcissist empathic abuse cycle. And the empath is always just, um, seen as a, a victim and the narcissist is an abuser. And while in many cases that is very true, it does take two to tango to do the dance, okay? And so it's really important that both the narcissist and the empath realize what their part in this dance is in order to be able to see clearly where, how to exit the dance and move towards healthier, healing their wounds and a health, healthier relationships, okay? So we're going to start, I have here in the middle, this is N stands for narcissist, E stands for empath. So the first stage we know is the idealization stage where they, uh, they say that the narc idealizes the empath they call it also the love bombing stage but let's look at both parts in this tango because we've all, all heard about the love bombing stage but what is the stage that the empath is in so the empath is usually the one that is immediately attracted to the narc and usually it is because there is a wounding inside her that she is subconsciously trying to heal still. Perhaps she had narcissistic parents. I don't know. There could be so many different reasons, but there's usually wounding, okay? So both of these in this dance are wounded individuals, all right? The, end, the empath is attracted to the narc, and because an empath is who, she, who an empath is, he or she, empaths know things like they feel people's energy and they know things even sometimes before that other person even realizes or knows it about themselves. Empaths are very, very in tune to energy. They feel it. They absorb it. They feel it at a, a physical, a spiritual, a mental level. Okay. And so at a sub, almost at a subconscious level, she may be attracted to some physicality and things about them, but what she sees or he sees, I'm going to just say she and he for now, but with, this could be interchangeable, but otherwise I'm going to get this all tongue tied. But what she would sees is a need. Okay. She sees a dynamic individual, but deep down underneath it all, she sees how much this person needs to be praised and to be loved and to be validated. And and so she understands this at, at the heart level, at the wounded level. And she knows how to give the exact right attention to that narc that she's attracted to. She knows how to give him what he is seeking. Okay, she praises him. She focuses on him. She gives him the attention he needs. She does anything for them. So she just pour like an empath does. She pours her heart out because that's her natural inclination to give and overgive at times. Okay, so, but what happens with that, when she starts doing anything for them, this exudes from her this servitude or this elevating of them. They feel this as, oh, look at her. She's serving me. She's elevating me. She's actually maybe not even... No mostly not even knowing, making him feel like 
a king. Maybe she even knows that, but she doesn't think, oh, at this point, he's an ark and you know, he's getting a supply for me. She doesn't even realize this at this point, okay? But that's what's going on. She's praising him. She's focusing on him. She's doing anything for him. And this is making him feel like he's got a little servant, making him feel really elevated, like that kingly position that he wants to feel. We see a lot of this in religious situations when the woman is supposed to be more of the giver and the, the man is supposed to be the king of his house, you know, and she's the queen and he makes the final decision. And we start just playing these roles and we don't even realize we're playing roles. We're doing a dance. It takes two to tango. Okay, the narcissist loves the attention. So again, we're in the idealization, the love bombing stage. He loves this attention. So he goes into charm mode. So he's not like the empath. Okay, again, he's, pre, he's a projector. He's not an absorber. He doesn't understand the empath's needs like the empath understands his. What he understands is that, wow, look, she's making me feel really great. I feel like a king around her. I feel like I'm so important. I'm very important. And so he's loving this attention. He's going into charm mode. So he's practiced and he's learned. What do I know about women or men, depending on what who they're attracted to, right? What do I know about what they like or this person likes? Let me be charming the way I understand that charm is supposed to work. How do I impress them? How can I further impress this person? They're so impressed with me. They're doing anything for me. Let me really reel them in with the charm. Okay? So this is the idealization stage. It can last a long time. It can last for a few years even. But eventually, it's going to fail. And the reason it fails is because they're wounded people and they're trying to get their needs met from each other rather than healing their wound and learning how to feel self-worth from within their selves. That is key and I'm gonna keep repeating that. So this eventually starts to fail. And so what happens? We have the empath. Eventually her attention has to shift. Okay, she's can't, nobody can keep their undivided attention on anybody 24 seven. Okay, they have their own needs. Maybe they have children and you know, her attention starts to shift to her children or she has friends that she wants to go out with. Uh, she has uh, employment that keeps her distracted or hobbies that she loves to do. And her attention starts to shift off of the narc. It's not as focused on him. And so he feels that. He feels that lack of validation because that's the narc supply right there, that they have got them in the center of, of their world and they're serving them and they're praising them and they're treating them like they're the most important person on planet earth, right? And all of a sudden that's shifting and that's starting to trigger his wound, which is I am not worthy of love, no self-worth, okay? So he gets irritable. And because he's a projector, he projects, he's going to project it on to the empath. She's not doing what she's supposed to be doing. She's not making me happy. She's not pleasing me. And he'll start finding fault with everything she does and who she is. And he just, he'll start devaluing her. In return, the empath feels the lack of validation. Okay, because she wants to be needed and she wants to be appreciated and adored for how she just is so um, carefully meeting the, everyone's needs. And suddenly all they're doing is finding fault because really she's not meeting the needs 24-7 that the narc feels like they need because they're wounded. So she starts to feel hurt unappreciated, her wounds come up, she starts to absorb, okay, um, the narc's frustrations and proje pro projections. She starts to absorb that into her and she just feels more and more hurt and withdrawn from them because the more they project, the more she pulls back from them and the more she pulls back from them, the more they feel like 
They're not getting the attention and adoration that they need. And so it's this vicious circle and they start to spiral down from the idealization to the devaluing of each other. Okay? Now we have the discard stage. And what I want to really emphasize in this discard stage is that they're both discarding. Okay? We understand that in a classic style narcissistic personality disorder that the discard is usually a dump okay so but let's just talk about the dance between the the, the highly narcissistic and the highly empathic or highly sensitive they're both highly sensitive the highly empathic person okay the empath throws herself into her kids more she, she just tries to get her mind off of him because she doesn't want the drama she throws herself into self-improvement. So she thinks maybe if I, you know, better myself, he'll like me better. He won't, you know, she tries to deflect by improving herself, deflect all his projections. She get, goes out with her friends more, talks on the phone more, gets on her, you know, her texting more or whatever. And eventually she ends up with a fuck you attitude. She gets so frustrated with no matter what she does, He's still projecting his bullshit on her, so she gets a full fuck you attitude. So she has discarded him even if she still remains in the relationship. When you have a fuck you attitude to the person you're with, you have discarded that person. Emotionally, you have discarded them. Okay? The narc, he's looking for validation and praise and attention and sympathy elsewhere. So the narc will sometimes go to family and t and complain to them or, or neighbors and that they'll play the martyr and I do so much. I'm, I'm such a hard worker. I'm so important and this, I don't get anything in return for that. This person is a, a burden for me, you know, and they get, they get a lot of sympathy going from people. That's when they sometimes will triangulate because they're looking for their praise, their attention elsewhere. Okay, their admiration, all that. They are looking for it elsewhere. They want everybody to go, oh, poor you. You're such a wonderful person. Look at you stick, sticking this out. But then when they, if they actually do, which happens a lot, go out and cheat, a lot of people think, well, if she had only met his needs. <laughs> and she might even think that sometimes, right? So anyways, he's discarded her. When he starts to get his validation, and his supply elsewhere, he has emotionally discarded his partner, okay? Neither one of them is loving each other or meeting the needs that they originally got together for. They've both discarded each other. Now, I will point out that these needs are unhealthy to begin with. We need to be able to have these needs to be able to to self-regulate, to be able to uh, feel self-worth within ourselves before we get into relationships. But most of the time that doesn't happen because we don't go to a school psychology and learn these things, right? We just get into relationships. We don't know. We don't understand this. So none of this makes either one of them bad or the demon. It just is what it is. And that's how we have to look at it by going for awareness, awareness, not saying that this makes them bad or me bad or whatever, but by saying, oh, look at, I see the dance that I'm in and that it takes two to tango. And I don't like this dance. I don't want to be in this dance. So let me see what's going on in this dance and how I can get out of this dance. Okay. So then the next stage they call hoovering. And this is basically when they say that the narc now makes his move if he loses the empath, if he hasn't already dumped the empath, but he loses her, he's going to make his move to win her back. And then he's going to start the idealization stage. He's going to go back to, okay, charm mode. What do I know about what he or she likes? How do I impress them? He's going to go back into that. And the reason why he's going to go back into this and he's going to start hoovering is because if he loses the empath, 
If he hasn't dumped her, if he dumped her, that was one thing. But if he loses her, if she continues in this fuck you attitude and he knows he's lost her, this means he's unworthy. That's the meaning he's given it. Because his worthiness came from her worship of him. Okay? So now that she's on the opposite end, now she's not, not only not worshiping, but she's fuck you, right? That gives that meaning back to him. And so he's going to get desperate. He's going to feel desperate. And he's going to want to start getting her back to idealizing him, like back to thinking he's the wonderful guy that he really is inside. And a lot of times this starts with, in this stage, it starts with, um, feel sorry for me because she's an empath and he's realized that that's where he can get her right in the heart. If he makes her feel like he feels bad, if he makes her feel like, you know, I'm trying and I just don't know how and please feel sorry for me. He knows that's how she works. And so that's how he works. And then for the empath, she does some hoovering or she get sucked in by the hoovering, maybe I should say more, because to let go of this wounded person means that she's unworthy. It puts her back in her wound because she needs to be feel like she's the one that helps and this person is needy. And if she let, lets go with him, she's just leaving him to his, his own wounds and, and how can she do that? That's what makes her feel needed is that she goes to the rescue and she helps them and she helps them to become a better person. She helps them to feel better about themselves. She helps them to whatever. And that's what gives her her self-worth. And so she sucked back in to that. And then they are back in this stage, which usually doesn't last as long as the first time around because each time they start to get a little bit more aware of, wait a minute, <laughs> back to square one here, what's going on? And they start to investigate a little bit more and realize, oh, this is what's going on. Okay, so of course, being a self-love coach, my key that I am going to talk about is genuine self-love. Now I have a whole course that teaches genuine self-love, a coaching course that I created specifically for this. And the reason being is that I went through tons of healing and therapy and it wasn't until I genuinely learned to love myself and continue to work on and challenge my self-love that I started making real progress of overcoming depression and improving my relationships and getting excited about life again. <clears throat> so the key to getting out of the dance is, well, first of all, is recognizing that you're in the dance, becoming aware of it, so that once you, you're aware of the cycle, you can stop contributing to that cycle. And that's an, a whole other video. But the key is that you have to learn to genuinely, genuinely love yourself. And the reason why I named it genuine self-love is because a lot of people believe that they love themselves. They don't have like real strong senses of self-loathing or self-hatred. They, they believe they're genuinely love themselves. They don't really question that. And yet their patterns in their life speak differently. Okay. So here, I just wanted to go over some signs that you are still trying to love yourself rather than genuinely loving yourself, okay? <clears throat> these are just some, there, there probably could be a, a huge list to this, but these are just some that come to my mind immediately. And the first one is that you're constantly trying to change something about you or and that whatever you're trying to change about you takes drastic and painful measures. So you're constantly putting yourself in painful situations and things that are just really hard and really stressful so that you can change something about you, okay? And or conversely, you may want to do some things to change, like maybe go get that gym pass or go get a, 
a really good haircut or whatever, but you're always giving yourself excuses why you can't. You're always saying, I can't afford it, or um, I need to use the money somewhere else, or I don't have time, or whatever, okay? You always have excuses of why you can't focus and do something that you want to do. The other sign is that you work out incessantly. When you work out incessantly is a sign of you trying to love yourself. You're constantly trying to improve and be the strongest and be the healthiest. And it's just to a point where it's not even healthy. Or it could be the opposite. You could be incessantly eating and watching TV or doing being on social media or playing like video type games, right? You could be incessantly doing that type of things. So anything that you're doing incessantly that's distracting you from thinking about you or that you're trying to do to change yourself, like working out incessantly, just so you can change yourself or make yourself better, you might be still trying to just love yourself. It might not be a genuine self-love. You might want to check that. Uh, you feel constantly restless, like you constantly have to do something. If you're, you, if you sit down for at any amount of time, you're just, you're shaking your leg and you, you might even call them, I just got ADD or whatever, but you're just constantly restless or you're always tired and lethargic. That's another sign that you're still not genuine, genuinely loving yourself, but still just trying to love yourself. Because sometimes when we're restless, it's because there's so many things underneath that need to be resolved but we are restless because we are keeping it pressed down. And the only way that we feel on top of that is when we're doing something that's distracting us. So if we're not distracted, we feel completely restless because we're feeling that trying to come back up again. You obsess over how many likes you have on social media. And you also obsess about who does and doesn't like your posts. So you you post something and then you're looking at how many likes. You also might be comparing yourself to other people on social media. Well, look at they have this many likes and I only have this many and my post is just as good. Why didn't anybody see my post? Why, why didn't this person like my post? Look, she doesn't like any of my posts. She's always liking that person's post or he, he's avoiding me or blah, 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 right? You're just obsessing over your likes on and your social media. <clears throat> or you avoid social media because it's triggering to you, okay? So you're completely avoiding it, which there's nothing wrong with any of these things. And what it is is it's a telltale sign that you need to work on your genuine self-love. So it's not saying that something's wrong with you if you're doing this. It's just signs that you need to dig. You need to focus a little more on how you can heal some wounds and love yourself genuinely, okay? Generally, there is an unhappy, unfulfilled, and unfocused way about you. So no matter what the signs are, underlying it all, there's unhappiness, you constantly feel unfulfilled and you feel unfocused. You might have times where you're having fun and you feel good, but generally you feel unfulfilled and unhappy and unfocused in life. And what I mean by unfocused is you really don't know where to put your energy or your focus on. You don't know where you're going in life. You don't know, you don't really have any goals. You don't even know what the point of life is. You have this general unhappy, <coughs> I'm sorry, unfulfilled feeling which is, you know, um, indicative of depression as well. Okay, lastly, I just want to go over what genuine self-love looks like. And when these things are in place in our lives, and they can be interchangeable, by the way. I just thought more of the empath and the narcissist here. But when we have these things in place firmly within us, we have exited the dance. We have entered a genuine self-love and our life is improving and our relationships are healthier. For an empath, it looks like I'm tuning into myself. So rather than tuning into everyone else, I'm tuning into myself. And I'm understanding my needs. I differentiate between my emotions and others' emotions. So a lot of times the empaths sometimes uh, have to work on knowing when 
what they're feeling is not even theirs, but belongs to somebody else's. So they differentiate between their emotions, somebody else's. I know I have value. I know who I am and what I want from life. I am not responsible for anyone's happiness but my own. I know how to pleasure myself. And this can be sexual, but in general, it's just how to feel the pleasure of life. So you, she knows how to pleasure herself rather than always trying to pleasure everybody else. I support myself. I have healthy boundaries. I have healthy relationships. For the narcissist, what genuine self-love looks like is I am good enough. I approve of myself. I am enough. This is, I said this a couple times because this is so important for the narcissist to be able to heal the wound of I am not enough because basically it's from that place that they are um, overextending and going that pendulum swing of trying to be more than enough, right? So I am good enough. I approve of myself. I am enough. I take full responsibility for my actions and reactions. So that's pulling back on the projection. I am worthy of love and attention. I can differentiate between my own opinion and someone else's opinion and I can accept it. My only competition is myself. So as in bettering myself or you know how well I did last time compared to how well I do this time, that, that constant improvement and evolution that we all are experiencing. I do my best and that, that is good enough for me. It is not my job to impress anyone. It is safe to be me. It is safe to feel my heart. So feel what's in your heart, feel your true emotions. I create trusting relationships. The narcissist is a very distrusting person and they don't trust themselves. They don't trust others. They tend to be manipulative and sneaky because they don't believe in trust, in trusting other people or trusting themselves. They're kind of in a, a this um, game of life that they play, that they've learned to play to survive, that they've been taught, trained in for years, and now they're playing it. And survival means you know, being the winner, playing the game. So it's part of the whole dance that they get into with the empath. And so it's exiting those games too and realizing that they can feel their heart. They can realize that where the distrust came from and that they can create trust in themselves and then con uh, consequently in relationships as well. So this is the key to exiting the narcissistic empath dance and to getting your life in aligned with who you are at your core to where you do feel good and you do feel genuinely happy and fulfilled in life. It's genuine self love. I can't emphasize that enough. So many people try so many other things other than going within and really challenging their own uh, self view and their own self love and their own self worth. That's where it all, that's where the roots are all um, either rotting or being nurtured, nurturing their life. Oh, I know this has been a long video, but hopefully it has been helpful for you. I will do some timestamps in the bottom. So if you want to revisit this video, any aspects of it, it'll be easier to hop right to what you want, what you want to review. Also, I have a course at highvibeslife.com. I'll leave you the uh, link in the description for my website for genuine self-love. I also have a video that basically gives it all to you in a nutshell if you wanna do it on your own, work on it on your own without the assistance of a life coach and some a program that is designed to help you dig and to get quickly to where you wanna go. If this has been a really helpful video for you and you've had some really good enlightenment on your situation, please leave a comment below and also give this video a thumbs up 
And if you haven't already, maybe you'll subscribe and they say hit the bell so that you can be notified when I do a new video so you don't miss anything. So I think I said that all right. <laughs> Talk to you later.